and round up the topic that we started last weekend, last Sunday, uh, which is um, love in marriage. Uh, last Sunday, we look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. We look at Ephesians 5, 25. Uh, it read, for husband, this means love your wife. From the NLT. For husband, this means love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church. For husband, this means love your wife. So we are focusing on the word love. We are looking at the word love. And we stated that the passage obviously raised the bar by clearly spelling out a man's responsibility or the husband's responsibility. The, there was a bar. And one of the things that we, we identify as a bar is the analog of how Christ loved the church. We talk about how Christ loved the church, a replica of that that must be made in our homes is a replica of love that husband must demonstrate towards his wife. And we said that because we have this analog of, of Christ, it takes the whole thing to a new level. A new level. And men must rise and meet the challenge. So if, I, if the question is, how should a man love his wife? The answer is, as Christ loved the church. Hallelujah. A man must love his wife as Christ loved the church. So if you love your wife on the contrary, you are failing your wife. Because Christ is the model. Christ is the example. Christ is the, is the, is symbolizes the, the fellowship, relationship between the church and the Christ symbolize how a man should love his wife. And then we went to define love. And then we said that the most dangerous thing is to define love by infatuation. Infatuation is that feeling you have towards the opposite sex. The feeling that you want to sleep with them, you are drawn to them for the purpose of, for, for sexual purpose. That is infatuation and that is not love. So infatuation is not love. We also say it is dangerous to define love by feeling of lust and arousal. And we stated that if this is what marriage is all about, then your marriage, my marriage is not safe. So if the reason why I'm married to my wife is because of just sex, then our marriage is not safe because I can then or she can then go and do that elsewhere. Uh, in Matthew 22, 34 to 40, Jesus summarized love as love God and love others. And we said the husband must love and lead like Jesus. So we began to look at how we can demonstrate this love that we are talking about. How can we, husband, demonstrate this love? How can we show our wife? So it is one thing to talk about it. It's another thing to actually know how to do it and do it properly. The will of God is that you do it properly. So the first thing we mentioned last Sunday was that listen to your wife. You must listen to your wife. James chapter 1, verse 19, we use that passage. We also say that to be truly hard is the longing for every woman heart. Everybody wants to be hard. Everybody wants to be listened to. Our wife wants to be listened to. We went as far as saying that women find it intoxicating to have a man in their life who actually listen to what they have to say. And we went to say that um, it's important that when you are talking to your wife or when your wife is talking to you, that you eliminate distractions. Remove your tablets. Don't be on the Facebook when your wife is raising crucial book, crucial issues with you. Don't be on your WhatsApp. Don't be playing games on the computer when your wife is raising crucial issues. So we say eliminate distraction. The second point that we raise is communication. We say that it's important that uh, husband and wife have a robust channel of communication. Husband must find a way to communicate, to express their mind, express their heart, express themselves in their relationship. It's vital. A good 
Communication enhances marriage because it provokes understanding. So today we want to progress about how can we biblical love towards her wife. The third one I'd like to mention is sing her praises. Sing her praises. Sing. When was the last time you sing praises of your wife? When was the last time you praised your wife? You must praise your wife. Brag about her qualities. Brag about her qualities at every opportunity. Especially among your friends and family. Proverbs 5.15 and 18. Proverbs 5.15. The Bible says, drink water from your well. From your own well. Share your love with only your, with only your wife. Number 16. Why spill the water from why spill the water of your spring in the street? Some people like to complain about their wife rather than taking the issues to her. Some women, the first time they are hearing about the issue they have with their husband is from their families, from their friends. And that should not be the case. That is why the Bible says, why spill the waters of your spring in the street? Having sex with just anyone, verse 17. You should reserve it for yourself. Never share it with strangers. Now, 18. Let your wife be, be a fountain of blessing for you. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your, of your youth. So, the, the, thing, the key thing here is that a husband who can't find a kind of word to spear about his wife is shooting himself in the foot. If you can't find the right word to describe your husband, I mean your wife, you can't find the right word to describe what she's doing that makes you happy. If you can't find the right word to be able to appease your wife, to be able to position your wife, even your own family. If all you do is bring her down when your parents are around, if all you do, all we do, I'm, 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 I'm part of you as well. If all we do is bring our wives down, then we are shooting ourselves in the, in the foot. But mount, but mounting your wife reflect more poorly on you than on the woman you married. So don't bat mount your wife. Don't pull her down. Colossians 3 19. Colossians 3 19. Colossians 3 19. Husband, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Don't treat your wife harshly. Don't bat mount her. Don't bring her down in front of the in laws. Don't bring your wife down in front of your brothers, of your sisters. Don't mess her around. Treat your wife the way you want your family to treat her. If you maltreat your wife, very certain that your family will also maltreat her. I pray that God will help you to love your wife accordingly in the name of Jesus. The key question for reflection is, do you want to strengthen your marriage and make your wife feel loved? Do you want to strengthen your marriage? Do you want to strengthen your marriage and make your wife feel love? Because if you don't do all these things, your wife will not feel love. It's not just about saying, I love you, I love you, I love you, to get your wife on the bed. You also have to go extra mile to appease your wife, to serve your wife, to be by her side, and also uh, to brag about her, to brag about her. Brag about your wife. Shamelessly brag about her good qualities and pray about her bad ones. We know that women are not perfect. Women are not perfect. Our wives are not by any means perfect. They have their issues. But bear this in mind. Your wife's reputation is your reputation. Your wife's reputation. So if you bring your wife down, da 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 da, -da is this and that, that is all about you. Your wife reflects you. Your wife reflects you. Our wife reflects us. Exodus chapter 9, verse 9. Exodus chapter 9, verse 9. Exodus chapter 9, verse 9. From the NLT. Do you hear me, guys? Okay, thank you. He said, live happily with, your, with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of your life that God has given you under the sun. Exodus chapter, chapter 9. Sorry, I, stammer. I, can't, I can't pronounce that word properly. But if you put it up, I will know you hear me. Nine. Exodus chapter nine, verse nine. Yes, that's the word. Exodus chapter nine, verse nine. Not Ephesians. You say you hear me. You didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. 
So there are some words that um, when I'm ministry, I may not pronounce them properly. Live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of your life, of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God give you is your reward for all your earthly toy. I hope men understand that. <laughs> uh, live happily. Don't take it away. With the woman you love through all the meaningless days of your life, of life that God has given you under the sun. The wife God gives you is your reward. So stop complaining about her. Stop complaining about your wife. She's your reward for all your earthly toy. Praise is every bit. Praise is every bit than the vast majority of the alleged constructive criticism. You must praise your wife rather than criticizing her. Praise her. Praise her. Praise every bit rather than criticizing and then you are giving constructive, I mean, constructive criticism. And also to unlock the power of praise, the first step is to seek things that can be praised. You understand that a lot of things can be praised about your wife that we shut our eyes on. That we shut our eyes on. Proverbs 31, verse 29. Proverbs 31, 31, verse 29. Proverbs 20, 31, 31, verse 29. The Bible said there are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. Tell your wife she's beautiful and you meant it. Hallelujah. Don't say she's beautiful and then you are just saying that and you didn't mean it. Tell your wife she's virtuous and you meant it. Tell her she's incomparable. You can't compare her. You can't compare her. Describe your wife by the shape that she possesses. Your spouse may be physically beautiful or, or musically talented or obviously outstanding in the number of ways. If so, let her receive regular praise. Don't pull her down. Praise her for what she's good at. Is your wife truthful? Commend her honest and integrity. Praise her for being principal. Is your wife hardworking? Praise her for diligence and initiative. Thank her for all she does to keep your home running smoothly. Is your wife a good mother? Acknowledge her patience with the children and the tender love with which she cares for them. Does your wife cook for you? Then praise her for that. Don't tell her that her soup is... Um, <laughs> or it's too much salt. You know how women moan about everything. <laughs> Hallelujah. If your wife cooked for you, thank her for the time and effort she put into preparing that salty meal. <laughs> Don't condemn the meal. Does your wife take care of her appearance? Is your wife very elegant when she dress up? Let her know how much you appreciate that. Some men don't do that. They will just talk when your wife, when the wife dress her godly. <laughs> Let your wife know how beautiful she is when she dress up. Hallelujah. Amen. Even sometimes our wife's negative behavior can be constructed positively. Yeah, it can be. Is your wife a little bit nicky picky? Praise her attention to details and pray about how you might help her to channel heat in a more constructive way. Does your wife have grudges? Is she the one that when you offend her, she does not let it go? Then she probably has a good memory. <laughs> yeah? And you've got to praise that. You've got to praise that. You've got to try and appreciate that she can recall things and, and help her to focus on good, the good things, the good memory. Rather than the bad ones. Yes, she would. The Lord God will help us in the name of Jesus. We must praise our wife. We must praise them. The point number four. Pray for your wife. Pray for and pray with your wife. How many men does that? Please, if you are not praying in your household, you must start to down. If you are not praying, if you are a child of God, you are born again and you are not praying, please start to. Start to pray with your wife and pray for your wife. Men, pray for your wife. Colossians 4, 2. The Bible says, devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself. Colossians 4, 2. Verse 2. 
Verse 2. Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and thankful heart. And they'll say, devote. Couple must devote. The only way you can subdue the power of Satan is if you pray. If you don't pray, Satan will ravage your home. Satan will ravage. We pray about altar. There are altars everywhere. Do you have an altar of God in your house? Do you have the power that you can draw upon when the storm comes? Please, it's dangerous to be prayerless in your home. It's dangerous. Please don't run a home that they don't pray. Please, create a spiritual hub in your house. Create a spiritual hub. You must rely on something. If you don't pray, then maybe you have a body somewhere that gave you something. If you don't pray and you don't have that power from the world, then you are in trouble. They will finish you off. But then you need the power that be. You need the name of Jesus to settle in your house. Yes. That's why you must pray with your wives. Proverbs 3, verse 3 says, Commit your work to the Lord and your plan will be established. Yes. Why do we need to pray for and alongside our wives? Because prayer enables us. Prayer enables us to, bring, to build a stronger, to, bring a, to build a stable and healthy marriage. How else could we have survived 20 years of marriage? 14 years of marriage, 15 years, 20 years, 40 years without prayer in this difficult world. In this difficult, what's the word, sir? Fragile. fragile world. In this fragile world, in this vulgar world. The world that is teaching women that they have all the power and they can use that power. Yes, ma'am. They can use that power. And if you don't teach her how to pray, she can push you aside. Satan can push you aside. Devil can push you aside. People can come between you. Even the children can come between you. The commitment to pray together not only make couple to become physically one, they also become spiritually one as well. The people that pray together, they stick together. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. So when you pray with your wife, you are more likely to stick true and wither, wither storms than when you don't pray. Pray alongside your wife with strengthening your relationship like nothing else. And the study shows that couple who pray together stay together. I can testify that. I can testify that. Furthermore, when you pray with your wife, you are going to take the marriage vows that you made with her seriously. At least you'll be thinking, if I do this to my wife, my prayer may not be answered. If I cheat on my wife, people that pray don't cheat. People that pray don't go about messing their wife about. People that pray don't beat up their wife. People that pray respect their wife. They serve their wife. People that pray, they, they, they do things that sustain their marriage. When a couple pray, they acknowledge God's vital role in their, in, the, in their marriage that they can only succeed through the power of prayer. Corinthians Boone said, any concern too small to turn into prayer is too small to be made into a burden. Please take notes. You need a prayer. You need a prayer. You need to pray for your wife. Pray for her brain. That God will mold her into a capable, intelligent, and virtuous woman. And will keep her thought center on whatever is true. Lovely, pure, right, noble, and worthy of praise. Pray for her eyes. Ask God to give her a eyes of compassion. So she could see others as he, God, sees them. Pray for her here. Pray that she, could, she will listen for God's still, small voice. And will remain ever attentive to his promptings. Pray for her mouth. Ask God to give her a mouth full of skillful and godly wisdom. When she opens her mouth, she opens in kindness and compassion. Pray for her heart. That God will fill your heart with love and respect for you. When your wife is antagonizing, you pray for her. It's not beating, it's prayer. It's not beating, it's not cursing her. That won't solve the problem. That was. That will actually make things worse. Go and ask men who have been there. They always come to Ashlaf reacted differently. 
Yes. If you have had issue with your wife on a large scale, it always comes down to the man saying, maybe I should have done it this way. But the reaction should be prayer. Pray for our arms. Pray for your, hand, for your wife's arms. That God should guard your wife with strength and her arm with strong and firm. Pray to God to teach her hands to war. That she can fight on your behalf. When your wife is weak, you are weak. I say to men, please don't allow your wife to be weak. Don't allow your wife to be the weakest link. Carry spiritually. Empower your wife. Empower your wife. I appreciate men who empower their wife to rise careerly, academically, who rise immigrationally, who rise financially. I, empower, I, I give kudos to those men. Pray for our feet. Pray for our leg. For strength and sustenance that she could walk and not faint and not tired of doing good. Pray for her. Pray for her. Number five, value your wife's individuality. Value your wife's individuality. Every woman is different. Please stop comparing your wife. Please stop comparing your wife. Stop comparing your wife with your ex-girlfriend. She's not your ex-girlfriend. Don't compare your wife with your mom. She's not your mom. She's your wife for God's sake. They are our wives. Stop comparing your wife. Your wife is wonderfully and fearfully made. Your wife is unique. Make no comparison. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, In the same way, you husband, you must give honor to your wife. Treat your wife with understanding, not with comparison. Treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are. She's your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as she should so your prayer will not be hindered. Don't compare your wife. She's different from your work colleague. You can't compare your work colleague for goodness sake with your wife. We must stop it. Don't compare your wife with your sister. Your mom may be the best cake maker. Your wife has something that she can do differently. Don't compare your wife. Try, try to appreciate your wife for who she is. And don't attempt to force her into the mold of what you think she should be. That's the problem, isn't it? Yes. I want my wife to be this. But she's a different person. That's how God made her. Accept her for whom she is. God alone can change anything your wife that is changing. Your effort to do so will fail flatly. Don't compare your wife. Men and women tend to view the world from different perspectives. We must understand that just because our wife approach things differently does not mean that they are wrong. They have different ways. Things can be different. They may come from, def from different angles. And if you are a man who feels secured, if you are a man who does not feel threatened, you try and understand her perspective more. You build on her perspective. She can be right. I discovered that most of the time when my wife is making a point, she's right, always right. Never wrong. Yes, we are both right, actually. <laughs> but my point is that she's never wrong. Because most things she's saying later, I come back, oh, yeah, she was right. Guess what? She was right. It's just that our approach is different. Our approach is different. Our approach is different. Our approach to those issues is different. Our worldview about this issue is different. But they are right. They are always right. Women, for example, are more usually emotional sensitive than men and are able better to read and interpret facial expression. When you take your wife to a, to a neighbor you. or you went out to eat with another family, your wife can look more closely than you do. You are just eating your meal. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> and your wife is studying. She's studying. That is how God configured them. They tend to be more nurturing by nature. Although we do have women who are unnurturing. <laughs> but most women are more motherly, more nature, more nurturing. And they tend to be more verbal. These are good things. We should view them as strengths, not as a threat. View them as threats. We must learn to value our wife individuality, our differences, and our input. Value your wife's intervention. Value it. Benjamin Franklin said, if everybody is thinking alike, then no one is um, thinking.
thinking. No one is thinking. You will be wise to look for such common ground with your wife in such a way that you can work together. Both using your unique skills, talent, aptitude, ability for the glory of God and for the good of your family, your church, and your community. The differences that we have must be channeled for the good of the church, our community, and for our family. We have the differences, but it must be used for the best. A.A. Mai said, the things that make me different are things that make me. That's for the woman. What makes them different is what makes them. Number six, don't treat your wife like a personal maid. She's not your maid. She's not your servant. If you need an up here, go and get one. Yes. Not your wife. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes, yes, chapter 2, verse 18, from the NLT. Chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord says, not good for a man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Thank you. The Lord says, not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. Now, if you give me the amplified, amplified. Now the Lord said, it's not good, it is not good, sufficient, satisfactory that the man should be alone. I will make him what? A helper mate, suitable, adapted, complimentary for him. Is there any mate there? Is there any servant there? No. Don't treat your wife like your personal maid. God designed your wife to be your helpmate. That does not mean she's your slave. Be careful not to treat her like one. Don't treat your wife like a slave. And how can we do this? How can we treat our wife not to be a slave or servant in the house? By helping them in the house. When was the last time you washed those plates? When was the last time you do the laundries? <coughs> Apart from doing your shift and coming back into the house with money, we need to help our wife. We must pitch in to help around the house. When was the last time you give the children bath and get them to school rooms? The Lord will help us, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. Whatever we think of our wife, whether assistant manager, assistant coach, your second in command, the implication is one of interdependency and sheer responsibility, not of master and servant. They are not our servants. They are our helpmates. The Lord designed them. The Bible used the word helpmates. They are not servants. I have to say this very, very clearly. We must not misinterpret submission to mean servanthood. Please, let's be very careful. This is very common among those who are conservative of the word of God. We have to be liberal of the word of God and view it as the Holy Spirit will help us to view it. The Bible used the word helpmates. God designed our wife as our helpmates. Does not mean they are slaves. We must not interpret our wife's submission to mean servitude. Matthew 20, verse 28. Remember, it's Christ like. The way we must run our home is Christ like. The Bible says in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to serve, but to be, not come to be served, but to what? To serve. Son of man did not come to be served, but to serve. Our role as husband is to, 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 is to serve, not to be served. Even though our wife, they are willing to serve us, but we must serve them as well. We must serve our wife. We are called to serve them. God brought them to our life to serve them. Just like Jesus served his church. He served me and you and gave his life as a ransom for us. Both husband and wife are in fact called to serve and defer in, in, I mean, to the other. It goes both ways. Galatians 5.13 says in verse B, it says, rather serve one another in humility and love. Serve one another in humility and love. Galatians 5.21 says, submit to one another out of what? Reverence for Christ. Submit to one another. Galatians 5.21, submit to one another. Submit to one another. Submit. We are called to submit. Yes, we are the lead. Yes, we are the authority. But we must do it in service, out of service. 
to our wife, to our children. Submit to one another out of the fear for, for God. First Peter 4.10. First Peter 4.10. First Peter 4.10 from the NLT. First Peter 4, verse 10. From the NLT. First Peter 4, verse 10. He said, as every man, give it that one, that one, KJV, KJV. As every man has received the gift, even so, minister the same to one another. Your money, your money, your skills, your jobs, your talents must be used to serve your wife. Whatever God gives you that makes you the headship must be used. Don't torment your wife. Stop traumatizing your wife at home. We must stop it. We must stop it. Lord God will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. We must serve in humility. Serve in humility. Your wife must not be treated as a second class in the family. Oh, she's just a wife. And then everybody in the in-law carcass, they talk down your wife. That is not acceptable before God. It's not acceptable. They are our co-workers. Our wife are our co-workers and co heirs in Christ. And we must treat them with honor and respect. And we are to live with them in an understanding way. That is how God wants it. We must treat them as co-workers, co-leaders, co-heirs in Christ. By Christ's own testimony, he came not to be served, but to serve. Every husband are appointed unto a woman not to be served, but to serve. Serve your wife. Don't treat her like a personal maid. And what happened? When we humbly following Christ's selfless example, his law will shine through our, through our heart, through our family, and through everyone who enter our home. Remember, when you put all these things in place, your, your home will be stable. Your home will be stable. Do you know why home is chaotic? Because this, there, is this, there is this competition for leadership. It's fierce. It's dangerous. It can create a breaking down in barriers. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. So men, we must do more in supportive of our wives. Serve them by do school runs. Serve them by do laundry. Serve them by cooking sometimes. Serve them by service their car. Serve them by giving them gifts. Shower gift on them. Serve them by say good word to them. Serve them in whatever way that always be lays in your heart. Don't be the boss. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. And the last point, because of our time, is practice servant leadership. Practice servant leadership. Model Christ in your home. Model Christ. Model Christ. Don't model a dear me. Don't model Gaddafi. Don't model Joseph Stalin. Don't model Abacha. Model Jesus Christ. Let your role model be Christ. You are the leader. I think we have said that enough. The Lord put us there for a purpose. The Lord put me and you are there as a purpose. There is a reason why there is a hierarchy in the house. Remember, it's Christ. Christ. Followed by we, the husband. Then the wife and the children. There is a reason for that. Because if we don't have a like in our home, it will be chaotic. It will be chaotic. It will be disorder. The home will be disorder. It will not function without anarchy. And you are the leader. And being a leader isn't about being a dictator or tyranny or tyrant. The best role model that we can look up to is what? It's Jesus himself. Not Joseph Stalin. Not Idi Amin. Not Gaddafi. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Husband, we are called to love our wife in the same self-sacrificing way. Ephesians 5, 20, 25 and 26. I think we've read it before. Mark 9, 35. Mark 9, 35. Let's open that NIV. Mark 9, 35. Mark 9, 35. Anyone who wants to be... Anyone who wants to be first, he must be the very last. And the servant of all. Anyone who wants to be the first. Husband, hear this. If you want to be the first, you must be the last. Don't put yourself above. Don't put your own interest above that of your wife. If there is little money in the house, 
And the money cannot buy everything. And the children need uniform. They need kit for the school. Your wife also has need. Release the money unto them. Don't go and use the money to do your own thinking. Don't go and use the money to do your own thing. Don't go and buy shoes and cars when there is a need in the house. Hallelujah. We must put ourselves to the very last. We must be the servant of all. Philippians 2, 5 and 7. The Bible says, having this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard in, I mean, equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but empty himself, taking the form of bonds, the form of bond servant. He was a God himself, but he, he, he took that humility. He disregarded who he, who he was. He took the form of a bond servant. Husband, you must do the same thing. You are the lead. But take the back seat. Don't dictate. Don't trash the house. Don't create a mess. Be the hands of God in your house. Remember, love does not dominate. Love cultivates. Love cultivates. So what are the three qualities of a leader, of a, of a servant leader? Number one, they must be transparent. They must be transparent. Transparent means honest, honesty, fairness, forthrightness, and above all, accountability. You must be accountable to your wife, to your children. You must be open. You must be honest. Transparency implies that there are no hidden agendas. Everyone is on the same team, on the same page, working towards the same goal, and those goals are clearly defined and understood. And I will add this. A southern leader is quick to accept blame, apologize, and ask for forgiveness whenever situation warrants it. Don't let things drag, 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 drag. I was talking to a pastor yesterday over an issue. And I remember I was at fault. And I said to him, sorry, straight away. He didn't drag. It was an issue, yes. Quickly, I said, pastor, I'm sorry about that one. But I could have dragged. I could have dragged. I could have behaved like, yes, I was right. Hallelujah. Amen. Be the kind of husband. When you know things have gone wrong, be responsible for it. The problem that we have with most men, they don't want to be responsible. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Shout a louder, amen. amen. Shout a louder, amen. amen. Second point, a salida is not above the law. Don't be above the law. When you set a rule in your house, subject yourself to that rule. Do not consider yourself to be above the law. What do I mean? If there is a rule, nobody smoke in the house. Don't smoke in the house. If there is a rule, nobody shout or trash the house. Don't trash the house. Don't be an hypocrite. And I don't think it's even fair on the children. When, you, when they see you smoking two packs of cigarettes in a day, and you are saying, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke. That is hypocrite. They will smoke. They will smoke. Whatever you don't want to do, don't do it at all. Don't do it at all. If you say that the home must be tidy, you must be an example of one that tidied the home. Hallelujah. Amen. Whatever you want to reflect in your house, you must be the one leading on it. John Maxwell says, a leader is one who knows the way, goes the way, and shows the way. You know the way, you must go the way. Hallelujah. Don't allow your wife to feel that you are a hypocrite. That's the problem that we have in the church. After we are done, our wife in the morning before church, and then we come here and we are singing, holy hand, holy hand, and the wife will be like, <laughs> look at him, hypocrite. That will not be you in the name of Jesus. That will not be you in the name of Jesus. Romans 12, 9. Romans 12, 9. Romans 12, 9. Romans 12, 9. We want to close now. Romans 12, 9. Love must be sincere. Give me NLT. NLT. Don't pretend to love others. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Eat what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. 
I'm reading from the NASB. It says, Love are without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Okay, let's not love with hypocrite heart. That is not what God wants. The third point here. A servant leader must think of others first. Put your wife first. Put your children first. Put your children first. Lead in a way that inspires others to follow. You must lead in a way that inspires your wife. You must lead in a way that inspires. I said to people sometimes, we must take initiative for leading. However, we must do that by showing us our wife and make them proud that we can make things happen. You must be someone that your wife can look up to no matter who she is and what she has. You must be someone that your wife can look up to. Because in the day that your wife thinks you are just empty, nothing, she will not revive you. Do you know why some men struggle? Because they are just there. They are not making an impact in the house. But remember as a man, God make you as an impact maker. God make you to be someone that provides direction, a solution provider. Your wife is there and she must be able to look up to you. And you must be in that position where you can give advice, directive, where you can give solution. You are the last bus stop in your house. The book rests with you. But if you are not intellectually, spiritually, physically able to, that can create imbalance in the homes. That's the point I'm making here. As a husband, the duty falls on you to take the lead in improving your marriage. Not the woman. It is you. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. few more points. Number eight, choose your wife over your hobbies. Choose your wife over your hobbies. When forced to pick Again, choose your wife again. When forced to pick, choose your wife. Don't choose your computer game. Don't choose Arsenal over your wife. Don't choose Chelsea. Thank God for yesterday. Don't choose Wolves. Those ones will go. Your wife will remain. Choose your wife again and again and again. And if possible, again. And the Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. I would like to make one more point. Set aside couple's time. Spend time together with your wife on a regular basis. You want to show love to your wife? Spend time with her. Don't just walk in and out. Seven days a week, walk in and out. Your wife know nothing about what is going on. Spend time with her. Take your wife out. Spend time with her. Quality time. Date your wife again. Date your wife. Hallelujah. Amen. I think we've done that before we get married. Amen. It doesn't stop there, yes. does it? So we must carry on doing it again. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Amen. I would also like to make one more point, the last one. Be careful with female friendship. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful. Uh -huh. does, that, does that sound familiar? Sound familiar, ain't it? <laughs> Be careful with female friendship. Be careful. Be careful. If, especially if you're a married woman, a married man. What are you doing with another woman? That at work, everybody is even asking, <laughs> what is going on between two of you? Yeah. And you are sharing lunch. God bless you, man. Abby. <laughs> Be careful with a female friendship. Because some of them can ruin your marriage. They can destroy your home. They are home destroyer. Yeah. Not everybody that you open your heart to wants you to succeed maritally. There are a lot of Delilah out there. A lot of Delilah. And they are there to ruin your home. They are there to snatch you from your wife. Be very careful. Be, be very careful. And I'm not saying that we should remove ourselves, isolate ourselves from, from the real world. In the real world, we meet women, other women. Some of them are her helpers of destiny, helpers of our career. But let's create Let's create what? Let's create boundaries. Let's create boundaries. Let's draw the line. Let's not put ourselves in a compromised situation. Abby? 
You are taking another woman out. You are opening your heart to another woman instead of your wife. Why are the men quiet? <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Men can quiet because they are listening to me. <laughs> Angie. They are listening. They are attentive. They are taking on board. As a man, when it comes to other women, please protect your reputation. Guide your reputation. Both at work, in your community, even in the church. Some of us men, we are very, we are very interesting. We respect other sister than our wife. We are very abusive, rude when it comes to our wife. But when that sister post is on the phone, we just mostly chill. That is sending a signal, isn't it? That something is going on. Guide your reputation. As a married person, this becomes dramatically more important since there are, the stakes are so high. Point number two, you must protect your heart. Our fears don't happen in the vacuum. Our fears happen over time. Things build on. Things hard to one point. And then our fears happen. Don't let our fears happen. Don't cheat on your wife. Point number three. You must be considerate of your wife's feelings. If your wife does not approve that sister, please don't go near her. And if you have a sister, declare her. We are just workmates. Let your wife know what is going on. Don't be hiding your phone from your wife. Don't take a phone call. And then you are going to the toilet to go and pick the phone call. Something is wrong. Hallelujah. Because of your wife's feelings. And also the, last, the final one here. You must be considerate of your female friend's significant others. It doesn't take time for people to beat up jealous. Before you know your wife is jealous. Even though nothing is happening between two of you. You are just workmates. You are just friends. But why will you have your friends anyway when you have your wife? The Lord will help us in the name of Jesus. Any question before we go? Any question? Any contribution? No, sir. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's celebrate God. Let's celebrate God.